In today's video, I'm going to look at a grassroots strategy for eradicating disease, uh, with the example being guinea worm in Ghana. This is part of the OCR A-level disease dilemma spec, uh, where we need to know a grassroots strategy, um, but also looking at the role of women um, in combating disease. So I'm going to talk about guinea worm in Ghana. Um, largely because it's been a very successful campaign. You can see from the graph here that in 1989 there were nearly 180,000 cases uh, of guinea worm uh, in the country. Uh, this had probably the second highest in the world at the time. By 2017 though there are no cases at all and as you can see from the change in the map a lot of the countries around it which had guinea worm have actually had similar success at getting rid of it. But I'm going to look specifically at Ghana and the fact that they implemented a grassroots strategy, which is the opposite of a top-down approach. This is led by NGOs and it, it's uh, the equivalent of bottom-up. So if we empower the people, then therefore they can make the biggest change. So first of all, I'm going to talk about how you actually get guinea worm um, and the kind of cycle of progression. So starting with a person who's drinking from um, a local water source, uh, but this water unfortunately has water fleas in it. These tiny little water fleas in the water, they actually carry larvae inside them. And when they get inside the body, that, that, the fleas release that larvae and that often congregates in the abdomen of a human being. While it's in the abdomen, um, there is a kind of procreation between the larvae and that's where it turns into this guinea worm. So this guinea worm is a really, really long uh, worm that looks a bit like a piece of string and it can grow to up to three metres in the abdomen. This takes quite a long time. It takes almost a year to happen. Um, and eventually, once it's, it's grown, it starts to make its way through the body and then it starts to actually... Um, leave the body through a limb so often a leg but sometimes through an arm and it emerges through this kind of blister a year after um, the initial infection when when this happens uh, this is really painful for the person as it's leaving the body lots of really um, sharp heated pain and so the way that people combat is they rush into water to kind of soothe that feeling unfortunately this is what the uh, guinea worm wants it to do because w when people go and put their uh, limb in the water what it does is it actually releases loads and loads of larvae back into the water once that larvae is back in the water that gets eaten by water fleas again and the cycle completely repeats itself so water sources that um, get contaminated with this once can often be repeatedly contaminated unless something um, is uh, changed uh, and altered. This is an example of what a guinea worm looks like. It's come off the, the, the limb of a person and, and it's really painful to extract. Um, it's a seriously debilitating disease. So the grassroots strategy that they implemented in Ghana was implemented by an organisation called the Ghana Red Cross, a bit like the Red Cross that we get in the UK. Um, and what they did was they recruited 6,000 local women to work with them and implement schemes to get rid of uh, guinea worm. Uh, and just a, another organisation I will talk about that is really important in the eradication of guinea worm is the Carter Centre. This is led by a former American president and they are their focus is actually getting rid of guinea worm. So they actually give resources to help organisations um, like the Ghana Red Cross. Um, they're also an NGO. So... The, the Ghana Red Cross, the, their, their focus was to um, teach female volunteers um, in these villages some skills which could help them eradicate the disease. They had actually tried this with men in the past, but they found that men didn't spend that much time actually in the village with the water sources. It was the women who were the gatekeepers. So they sourced the water, they saw that it was distributed, they had the most contact with the water. And therefore, um, as we can see here on the left, they are getting water often from ponds and lakes or rivers. And so the women were the ones that knew the most about it. When they did it with men, it wasn't as effective. So it was approaching women and making women responsible was uh, the real key to this success. What the women had to do was they um, distributed and checked cloth water filters. So this is a, literally a piece of cloth that you put over 
a bucket as you pour the water through it it stops all the water fleas from getting inside it so they had a really key role there they also um, showed people how to use them properly so th this is a lady showing how to tightly put the cloth round and ensure that uh, the water is being poured over it and, and that, that there's no tears or rips in the actual cloth the, the women also would all know where people were getting water from in the local community. And so they would identify water sources um, and make sure that the larvicides, which is a kind of insecticide, is put into the water to kill off all those water fleas and kill off all those larvae that are in the water. So they were responsible for identifying the sources. They would also educate locals and, and often because lit literacy rates weren't that high in some of these rural areas, they would do it using diagrams. If anybody did get the disease, they would make sure that those people isolated. And because they could recognise the symptoms very easily, um, they knew when to keep people away from water sources because if you get back to a water source, it obviously releases it back um, into the, the water sources. In terms of, I mentioned the Carter Centre earlier on, one of the things that they did that the charity um, Ghana Red Cross couldn't um, provide was they actually gave these uh, water filters. It's literally made from nylon. It hangs around people's necks and they can actually um, use it to drink directly from the water because it's filtering out anything uh, like the fleas or larva they would be in it. They're quite cheap and therefore there have been millions that have been distributed across Ghana but also the other countries um, in the world, thanks to the Carter Centre's, you know, global sense of organisation. Even though we've already looked to say that this was very successful in terms of reducing it from 1989 to 2017, the only thing I will mention is it did take a lot longer in the northern part of Ghana to uh, be eradicated. It was slower. Um, and this was the wor worst because it was the area of the highest prevalence. There were, there were quite a few factors, but one of the most significant factors was the fact that there was ethnic fighting in this region for a long period. That means that um, there was disruption to the, the, the strategies, but it also meant that people from the NGO who did the initial training couldn't actually get to the area to help um, educate the local women. And so therefore we can see this is one of those examples of a barrier to eradication of this disease. However, as we can see from this graph, in 2002, 2003, there's 8,000 cases. Back in 1989, there were 180,000. So even between then, there was um, a huge amount of success. But by 2015, it's actually been fully eradicated from the country. We can therefore see that this is a really clear, clear strategy that works, and it's largely by the fact that we empower a certain group, in this case women, uh, to be able to stop the disease themselves.